This episode is proudly brought to you by Podcorn. When I started Invisible Choir, I quickly found that we had an opportunity to make some additional revenue after we noticed the show rapidly growing. But I had a hard time finding and connecting with advertisers that wanted to sponsor a podcast in the true crime genre. Then I came across Podcorn. Podcorn is an online portal that connects podcasters like you directly with advertisers who are looking to promote their products, goods, or services through targeted podcast sponsorships. After quickly setting up your Podcorn account, you're able to browse through a list of sponsors looking for podcasts big and small to advertise on. It's an online marketplace made exclusively for podcasters. The cool thing about Podcorn is that they continuously update new sponsor opportunities on the website and have streamlined the traditional ad sales model into one that is fast, creator-friendly, and simple to use. And the best part is, you get to pick the brands that you want to work with by quickly submitting proposals, entering into easy, creator-friendly agreements, and then producing the agreed-upon content, all in a way that protects your content rights as the creator while ensuring ridiculously fast payment. Gone are the days of waiting 60, 90, or 120 days after an ad campaign finishes to finally get paid. So if you have a podcast and haven't checked out Podcorn yet, click the link in the show notes to learn more about how you can sign up and start browsing sponsorship opportunities today. Oh, hey there. You like true crime stories, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. Who doesn't? But I got to admit, after a while, all those stories of murder and heartache, well, they tend to go straight to my hips. So that's why I, Leroy Luna, have created a podcast called Excuse Me, That's Illegal, where we'll take a hardcore look at some softcore crimes. No TED Talks on Bundy here. The letters BTK won't be coming from these lips. Unless he had a brother that used to steal library books. Suppose I'd be willing to go balls deep into that one if that were the case. Anyways, you'll hear stories such as the Mad Pooper, a female jogger who wreaked havoc in a Colorado Springs neighborhood, using one family's front yard as her own personal dumping grounds. If this kind of content sounds like it's up your alley, excuse me, that's illegal. It's available right now on all your favorite podcatchers. So come join me. I'll be right here waiting for you. Reach Freaks. Invisible Choir explores detailed depictions of violence and murder and is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Public transportation. Most of us have utilized this method of getting from point A to point B at some point in our lives. For some, public transit is essential not only during the monotonous daily commute, but as an integral part of life, especially if you happen to live in or around a major city. Some of you may even be listening to this podcast on the subway or on the bus right now on your way to or from work. If that's you, Stop and take a look around for a moment. We tend to overlook the potential dangers we face every day, just being out in the world amongst others, especially when traveling in an enclosed bus or train car with large groups of people we know nothing about. It's not something most of us ever have to think about. If something were to go awry and we desperately needed to escape such an environment, but couldn't, how might you respond? This time, an invisible choir. You do have freedom of speech, you know, so do I, you know, so does you know, every other citizen. I also have the you know, freedom to ignore you. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Waves of his blood were running down the aisle towards me. Like you would see when a wave finishes hitting the ocean, the, the sand part. It was lapping down the aisle. For those of you who have spent any significant amount of time on any type of public transportation, you've likely come across some interesting people. Perhaps it's the passenger sitting or standing near you speaking to themselves under their breath or acting erratically in some way. But what if a passenger was harassing someone right next to you or verbally assaulting people for no apparent reason right in front of you, even threatening to harm them or spewing hateful language with regard to their race or religion? What if those being accosted were elderly, teenagers, or even young children who were simply minding their own business when they were attacked? What would you do? Would you stand idly by, counting down the seconds until your stop and your subsequent escape? Or would you confront that individual and attempt to intervene in some meaningful way to get them to stop? We would all like to think we would help the person or people in this situation, but not everyone has wired the same or possesses the same life experiences that might dictate how we respond. Everyone's fight or flight instincts react differently. In fact, we can never truly know how our sympathetic nervous systems might respond in such a scenario until we are actually met with grave danger, standing face to face, eye to eye, with someone intent on harming or killing us. May 26, 2017 was like any other Friday afternoon in Portland, Oregon. The city was beginning to bustle again at rush hour, with students leaving college and university campuses for the day, and people just getting off work and beginning their evening commute home. For most, Friday is seen as a day of relief. It's the time we take a much-needed break after a long work week, and a chance to look forward to the weekend ahead. This particular Friday was filled with even more optimistic excitement, as it was the start of Memorial Day weekend, which for most, grants an extra day to relax with family and friends. Commuters began to board the TriMet Max Green Light train that day, heading east towards Clackamas Town Center, just like they would any other afternoon. At just before 4 p.m., 
53-year-old U.S. Army veteran and Portland City employee Ricky Best boarded the train at Portland State University. Just a few minutes later at 4.01, 21-year-old Portland University student Micah Fletcher boarded the same train. He was spotted by fellow passengers wearing a Deadpool t-shirt and headphones while eating a snack as he boarded from the next PSU train stop. At 4.08, a 23-year-old environmentalist, Talesian Namkai Meche, boarded the train at Southwest 6th Avenue and Pine Street in downtown Portland. At 4.12, another passenger held the door for two black teenage girls, one of whom was wearing a hijab, and assisted them with boarding the train just as the doors were closing. Then, less than seven full minutes later, at 4.19, the futures of all of those previously mentioned, along with everyone else that was riding the max that day, would unknowingly be altered for the rest of their lives. As the train pulled up to its next routine stop at the Rose Quarter Station, in walked Jeremy Christian, a 35-year-old man with long brown hair twisted into a disheveled ponytail. He stood for a moment, lumbering high above the other passengers, standing six feet tall and weighing over 250 pounds. He also had a distinct scar beneath his right eye. Jeremy Christian boarded the train that afternoon carrying with him three books a science fiction novel, the Book of Mormon, and another entitled The Sagas of Icelanders, which he began holding out to show other disinterested passengers on the train. He began speaking obnoxiously loud about the contents of the book, and soon, his commentary escalated to more abrasive and hateful reflections about Jews and Muslims. At 4.25 p.m., security footage from the cameras on the train show Christian pulling out a bag of wine, tilting his head back, and then casually taking several large drinks. It was fast apparent to others on the train that day that Jeremy Christian was indeed intoxicated. Christian then notices the two young women that had entered the train just moments before he had, taking a particular interest in the young woman wearing the hijab. Without any solicitation or provocation, Jeremy Christian begins yelling aloud at the two young black women, causing those around him on the train to immediately take notice. Get the f*** out. Pay your taxes. Go home. We need American here. I don't care if you're ISIS. F Saudi Arabia. Christian then packaged his hateful tirade with, quote, Free speech or die. As he continues verbally attacking the two young women, other passengers quickly take notice some of them quietly pulling out their cell phones to begin filming, while others confront Jeremy Christian more directly once his attacks become more explicitly violent in nature. Passenger Sean Ford, a Brooklyn, New York native and four-time United States Marine Corps combat veteran, is the first to verbally engage Christian. There was a point where I had my, um, my ear buds in and I was listening to music, but I don't listen to it loud enough to where I can't hear people because, you know, well, I'm in the whitest city in the whitest state, so I've, I, you know, I'm, I'm aware of people maybe saying something to me that they think I can't hear, so... So I could, hear, um, some, I could hear someone yelling. And you know, me being from New York, I'm used to people acting a little bit um, extra on the train. They were yelling stuff about like, you know, cutting throats and cutting heads. So I pulled one earbud out and I could hear it clearly uh, being yelled. And that's when I, I looked at the young ladies first, who at first, you know, they were just kind of enjoying their ride. And, and, and at this point they were kind of just like either looking the other way or looking down and um, their entire demeanor changed. And so, uh, I didn't think at the time that it was directed at them, but when I looked over and I saw uh, the defendant, he was yelling directly at them. Because uh, he was looking right at him when he, when, he, what, when he was yelling. He was looking right at him and, and talking about Christians kill Muslims. And, and the only person at the time wearing anything re resembling a Muslim was one of the young ladies. But he was looking directly at him when he was saying, talking about cutting their heads off and slicing their throats. Sean Ford, hearing the despicable verbal assault unfold in front of him, repositioned himself between Jeremy Christian and the two young women, both of whom were minors. At the time, Ford stood just over six feet four himself and weighed nearly 300 pounds. He was a natural first choice to try to carefully de-escalate the situation. I changed my, uh, you know, my space where I was, where I was in the train um, to try and, you know, I guess shield them from from him, and uh, and, and maybe take some of whatever he was he was dishing out and and just kind of get him to kind of focus on me rather than focus on these two young girls. They look really young, you know. They look, you know, I'm a dad, so they look really they look they look young enough. Uh, and you can tell by the reaction, they, they were totally, totally like out of, you know, they were out of their sorts. Like they were really like scared. And so I just wanted him to focus on me. That's it. That's, that's all I could think of was I didn't want him to focus on them anymore and, and continue threatening them. As the train continues moving east, Sean Ford, now using his own body to shield the two girls from Jeremy Christian's aimless hate speech, instead finds himself on the receiving end of the drunken man's vitriolic rant. It was, you know, a, a whole lot of the rhetoric of Christians kill Muslims, we chop their heads off, we cut their throats, get out of my country, you know, go back to your country. Um, uh, you know, it was, he was right there on the cusp. He hadn't, you know, you know, used the N-word, you know, at that point, but, you know, he hadn't used the N-word at all, and not that I heard, but... I was waiting for that, like he was moving in that direction where it was more, it was just really, you know, um, just white supremacist rhetoric, you know. Sean Ford quickly realized that the best approach was to attempt to de-escalate the situation verbally without imposing himself into Jeremy Christian's personal space. He tries talking to the drunken, rambling man in an attempt to redirect his attention elsewhere, 
And at first, it appeared to be working. There was, there was a point where when I, you know, uh, kind of like interjected and started, you know, stood in between them. All I, all I was saying to him was like, hey, look, man, it's Friday. Ain't nobody trying to hear all of that, you know. Um, just stop, you know. And so, you know, he told me to have off and, you know, freedom of speech and, you know, it's his country. Get out of his country if I don't like it. And so I remember looking at, like, kind of like touching my hat or something like that. Because I, I always wore a, a black um, Marine Corps a hat with a Marine Corps emblem on it um, at the time. And I remember touching my hat and, and, and like, last time I checked, I probably got more right to this country than you do. You know, I've done more for it probably in a year than you've done in your entire life. You know, did, so, you, did you think that to yourself or did you say that to him? I'm pretty sure I, I said that, you know, somewhere in, in our back and forth. And because um, he kept, you know, with the get out of my country, you know, freedom of speech. And I remember at one point he, he jumped up and uh, he jumped up from his seat and he was basically like, do something, right, to me. And so, you know, I'm used to people trying to bait me. You know, I didn't grow up in, you know, like somewhere where I don't. I, had, I didn't have a lot of confrontation. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, so Jim, I was used to it. Sorry to interrupt, but go for it. Yesterday, yesterday, the defense attorney said, do something was a warning. Is that a warning or a challenge? Oh, it's definitely a challenge. I mean, I, I know that if I would have stepped forward and engaged with him, you know, we would have just engaged. Uh, but like I said, I'm used to being baited. Uh, so if he was not willing to come into my space, you know, because I don't know him from, you know, from Adam. You know, I just, just some random person challenging me on the train. I'm not going to go into, you know, into your comfort zone. You know, so I, I just I just stared at him while he said that, and then he, he waited a little while, and then he sat, he sat back down. The second to stand and confront Jeremy Christian was 23-year-old Talesian Namkai Meche. He got up from his seat behind him, walked forward, and then sat directly across from Christian in the same row. Talesian casually pulled out his cell phone and began filming Jeremy from waist height. But Christian immediately saw the phone and, in an instant, grabbed it and violently threw it to the ground. He then jumped to his feet, yelling aloud, do something, bitch, do something, while staring to Legion, who was now also standing directly in the eyes. So I, I think at that point when he jumped up and he was like, do something, uh, I think the young ladies assumed that something was about to happen. So they, they got up from um, where they were seated and they went up to the upper deck area behind me. Um, uh, I, I remember um, the young man, uh, Micah. He comes down shortly after that. I, I'm, I'm assuming he sees them destroyed. He comes down and he's like, hey, you don't talk to, you know, young ladies that way or something along that, along that, those lines. And, but he was like, you know, he was coming from my back. And I remember just like stopping him and saying, hey, you know, it's all right. You know, he's just talking right now. He's just talking. It's cool. He's just talking. You know, so, it, so there's a whole bunch of back and forth between, you know, the defendant and me, the defendant and Micah. And at this point, like there are, you know, multiple people on the train now just getting tired of the rhetoric. Uh, you know, the defendant is saying that he's a Viking which is more white supremacist rhetoric, in case y'all don't know. Um, so, you know, at this point, he was still talking about his country. He was like, at this point, he was, he was showing, I can't remember which arm, but he was showing off a tattoo and claiming that he was a Viking. And, uh, and, and so that became part of the, the rhetoric as well. Get out of the country. Um, we kill Muslims. We chop their heads off. And, and now everybody is, you know, well, not everybody, but a great number of people on the train are now like, just man, shut up. You know, like, you know everybody's getting tired of the rhetoric. And so he's engaging with a bunch of people now, telling everybody to shut up calling them punks and, and the B-word, and, uh, yeah, yeah. So it was, it was just a lot of that. And so at this point, you know, I'm, he's talking, he's still talking about freedom of speech, so I said, you know what, you're absolutely right. You, you do have freedom of speech, you know. So do I, you know, so does, you know, every other citizen. I also have the, you know, freedom to ignore you. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Because what all I saw him doing was he continuously just gradually got louder and louder and louder. Like he was amping himself up for something. And so at this point, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm done. You know, I'm almost, I'm about to get off anyway. So I was like, all right, I'll let the, the security deal with it. You know, so I, I said, I have the right to ignore you. And so I'm, I'm going to ignore you now. And so I started pushing the red button at that point when I told him I was going to ignore him. And I just started pushing the red button. Mere seconds after Jeremy is standing, now aggressively yelling into Legion's face, 21-year-old PSU student Michael Fletcher stands up as well. He heard the commotion through his headphones. And after taking them off to get a better idea of what was being said, he too took a stand for the two young girls and moved quickly to Talesian's side. Jeremy Christian continued yelling out, do something, bitch, do something, getting louder and louder with each taunt. When he saw Micah Fletcher quickly move in, he turned and shoved him in the chest, sending him back into the yellow support rail off balance for a moment. Not standing down, Micah Fletcher stood his ground, he and Talesian both now talking within mere inches of Jeremy Christian's face. Christian then reaches up and briefly grabs Talesian by the throat, and the 23-year-old takes a step back, briefly retreating to reassess the situation. Then, without warning, Micah Fletcher grabs the much larger Jeremy Christian by the waist and quickly hip-tosses him to the ground while yelling aloud, Get the f*** off, boy. Get off the max. Go on and get, while walking and pushing him towards the train doors. Jeremy Christian attempts to stand up, but before he can fully rise to his feet, Micah Fletcher shoves him down and back into an empty seat. Jeremy quickly stands up, taunting Micah, yelling aloud, Hit me again. Hit me again. 
In response, Michael Fletcher again shoves him in the chest. It was the last move any of the passengers made on the TriMet Max train that afternoon, before Jeremy Christian finally snapped and revealed the small weapon he had been concealing in his right hand since the yelling turned physical just seconds before. This episode is proudly brought to you by Best Fiends. Hey, True Crimers, if you're looking for a new mobile puzzle game that can challenge your mind and imagination, I encourage you all to check out Best Fiends. This puzzle adventure game is filled with colorful characters and a fun, silly storyline where evil slugs have taken over and they're sliming up everything they touch. But fear not, a brave group of heroes called Fiends are fighting back. Download Best Fiends and you can be that hero, blazing your own path through the world of Minutia. The objective is to solve fun puzzles and build up your own team of fiends that hold special powers that can help you defeat special puzzles and challenges along the way. Enjoy literally thousands of casual levels that are easy to play but hard to master. I think it's hands down the best mobile puzzle game you'll ever play. It really is that fun. I love playing the game during my downtime as a true crime palate cleanser, if you will. And I really like how it keeps my place and allows flexible play on my schedule. You can stop whenever you like and then pick up the game and play from right where you left off. It's that simple. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Before we can even fully begin to understand the darkness that wandered onto the train that day in Jeremy Christian, we have to go back, way back, to 2002. Jeremy Christian lived in Portland, Oregon his entire life. From accounts of the people that knew him best, Christian had been showing warning signs for several years before carrying out the train attack. He had a long history of violence and a criminal record dating back several years. But according to Christian's own friends and family, he wasn't always this way. In fact, the people that knew him in his early years remembered him as a likable teenager. He enjoyed heavy metal music, reading comic books, and grew up in a modest North Portland home with his older brothers and loving parents. His mother and father eventually split up, but it was never reported that any type of tumultuous home environment was ever present for the children due to the breakup. In fact, Jeremy's father decided to stay local to North Portland, even eventually returning to the home despite the divorce to ensure they provided a caring and stable environment for their children. But somewhere along the way, something changed in Jeremy Christian. In 2002, then a 20-year-old high school dropout, Jeremy Christian was living at a friend's house and working at Pietro's Pizza, a local pizzeria in town. Jeremy then started to become more distant and withdrawn from those around him. That year, he made an uncharacteristically poor decision, one that would send him down a path towards becoming a hard and fast criminal. May 2002, Jeremy Christian is involved in an armed robbery in North Portland. When officers arrived in the Mini Mart, the owner was handcuffed to a checkout stand. Jeremy Christian entered the store wearing a ski mask while brandishing a 38 caliber revolver. He then threatened to kill the store clerk and then handcuffed him to a cigarette rack. He fled the scene with roughly $1,000 in cash and cigarettes on his bicycle, but police would find him soon after, just a few blocks away from the scene of the crime. While confronting him, Christian then drew his weapon, and the police opened fire. When I came out the front door, I seen a gentleman laying in the street. It looked like they were bandaging up his head or doing something to his head. He was shot in the head. Police fired at Jeremy Christian three times. One of the bullets hit him squarely in the face, just beneath his right eye. He survived the near-fatal wound and was consequently convicted of armed robbery and kidnapping, and eventually sentenced to over eight years in prison. Christian would later claim that he had no intention of shooting at police when drawing his weapon, explaining instead that he was intent on killing himself. Christian then spent the majority of his eight-year, four-month prison sentence further devolving and acting out, getting into at least a dozen documented fights while inside. As a result, he spent much of his time in and out of the segregation unit, following the prison's strict disciplinary protocol. After longer and longer periods in isolation, he began to exhibit peculiar behaviors in prison. In one instance, he just refused to eat, participating in a hunger strike for no apparent reason. He ultimately turned down a total of 29 consecutive meals and lost some 30 pounds as a result. It was also reported that Christian specifically targeted and verbally provoked black and Hispanic inmates towards the end of his prison sentence, causing even more conflict and time spent in isolation. He was finally released from prison in September of 2010, but was arrested again less than 60 days later on November 27th for an armed residential burglary. Christian pled guilty to the charge of being a felon in the possession of an unregistered firearm. He was sentenced to time served and was placed under supervised release. Over the next several years, Jeremy Christian doubled down on his fringe beliefs and continued promoting his white supremacist views to just about anyone who would listen. Well, I'm a revolutionary. We brought all the Semitic monotheist child molesters over here. I'm a Viking. We brought them over here. Jeremy Christian can be heard in the clip from a March for Free Speech rally on April 29, 2017 in Portland. He would go on in the video to identify himself as a nihilist and a Viking and often spoke of Vinland, an ancient territory that once existed as part of a coastal North America that was explored by the Vikings nearly five centuries before the likes of Christopher Columbus. In the video, Christian wears a large Bennington revolutionary flag with a bold 76 in the center draped around his neck like a superhero's cape while carrying a baseball bat through the crowds. He was also photographed by local journalists giving a Nazi salute during the march. I am, no, I am here to provoke anyone because we live in a 
domestic situation where the only political affiliation that makes any sense is nihilism. I'm not on any of your side. Jeremy Christian clearly became obsessed with his idea of free speech. Just as he was quoted in the video, his primary goal was to provoke, even if what he was saying didn't make sense half the time. Jeremy often contradicted himself while expressing his hateful beliefs, yelling aloud one moment about his hatred towards Jews, and then bragging about voting for Bernie Sanders in the next. According to most accounts, Jeremy Christian was drinking alcohol heavily by this point, on a near daily basis. And it's around this same time that he also began promoting explicitly violent beliefs, proclaiming his support for the likes of Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma City bomber, on his Facebook page by calling him a, quote, true patriot. He was eventually asked to leave the free speech rally by both sides and was escorted out by police. Less than one month after this rally took place, Jeremy Christian boarded a Max train in Portland, Oregon by himself on Thursday, May 25th, 2017, just the day before he would eventually snap. You know, I just, you know, what I'm saying? Christians and Muslims and fucking Jews and fucking God. Burning in the state, just like the day I'm taking ancestors. Fucking God. You know what I did? What? I'm gonna do something about it. Fucking. Keep laughing, bitches. Oh, you motherfucking taxpayers on here? Fucking punk ass bitches. Taxation is death. They no tax. Fucking patriot. My police is the police. Fucking. Oh, it's like you got a Christian or Muslim fucking bus rider. I stab you too, bitch. Move forward. Demetria Hester, a prominent activist in the community, known for standing against racism and violence, happened to be sitting behind Jeremy Christian during his provocative outburst on the train and decided she had had enough. When Hester asked Christian to cease his violent offensive rhetoric, he not only disregarded her request, but instead decided to follow her off the train. He then assaulted Hester by throwing an unopened Gatorade bottle with extreme force directly at her face. The assault left her eyes swollen shut, and soon thereafter, Christian fled the scene. Police did not follow up or attempt to make contact with him after the incident, regardless of the fact that a physical assault had occurred, or that Jeremy began threatening to stab other passengers, including the driver himself. And perhaps what amounted to the literal definition of a warning sign, it was clearly evident that Thursday, before he finally snapped, that Jeremy Christian had deadly violence on the mind. From the intense anger and hatred in his voice, it was clear that he was already coming fully unhinged. But no one would have expected what was to come next that very next day after he stepped onto the TriMet Max Green Line again. The only difference this time was that the other passengers wouldn't remain physically passive to his intense provocations. After it had appeared Micah Fletcher had possibly gotten the best of him that Friday afternoon, after the two had exchanged words and began shoving one another, Jeremy Christian, getting up from the floor, discreetly retrieved a small folding knife from his right pocket. What you are about to hear next are the moments immediately after Jeremy Christian gets up from the empty seat after Micah Fletcher had thrown him down. Christian quickly stands up, stepping nose to nose with Micah Fletcher and readies the small four-inch folded blade in his hand before anyone notices. Then, in one swift motion, he flicks his wrist, exposing the now locked blade and proceeds to stab Micah Fletcher directly in the neck, causing immediate chaos and pandemonium on the train. Several different cell phone videos from multiple different passengers on the train that day showed Jeremy Christian, now in a full-on rage, stabbing Micah Fletcher once in the neck before turning slightly and then plunging the same bloodied knife deeply into Talesian Namkai Meche's throat. Christian relentlessly, in an extremely efficient and quick motion, forces his blade into Talesian's neck and then, after pulling it out, stabs him again in the head before he could even process what was happening. The way that Talesian's body was positioned, he had little to no chance of defending himself whatsoever from the attack. He was effectively blindsided. A woman standing directly behind Jeremy grabbed his arm in an attempt to stop the vicious attack, but then retreats after seeing the men fall one after the other. U.S. Army veteran Ricky Best, seeing the attack unfold, positions himself between Jeremy Christian and the two young girls, and then attempts to intervene. But Christian quickly turns, swinging the knife directly into his neck as well. He then pushes Ricky back and into Talesian, who had fallen into an empty seat after being stabbed, and was now desperately trying to stop the bleeding from his own neck and head. Christian then advanced on both men, plunging his knife again into each of their throats. Ricky Best immediately fell motionless to the ground, while Talesian, gasping for air, desperately struggled to stop the flow of blood rapidly exiting his body. Jeremy Christian then turned to exit the train after stabbing the three men a total of 11 times in the span of just 11 seconds. 
TriMet passengers scatter in all directions inside and out of the train as complete terror and utter panic ensues. After initially gasping incoherently, Micah Fletcher stumbles to his feet, pressing his palm against the open stab wound on his neck as he stumbles outside onto the Hollywood station platform. In a train surveillance video, you can clearly see Jeremy Christian still wielding his knife and forcing others back around him, yelling aloud, quote, who else wants some, as he flees the scene. Christian begins walking away from the train at an intermediate pace, stopping briefly at one point to pick up a bag that belonged to the young woman who was wearing a hijab on the train. While hurrying up the platform stairs, Christian hurls the bag far overhead and above a freeway barrier, where it falls down onto the heavily trafficked road below. Christian was located by police soon after, walking on the sidewalk in front of the Providence Medical Center, several blocks away from the TriMet station. Christian staggers back and forth in a circle, rambling unintelligibly at the officers, knife still in hand as caught on a video from an onlooker's cell phone. In the video, Christian casually sips what appears to be wine from a Gatorade bottle, while police surround him with their guns drawn. At one point, he throws his knife at a police officer, but it bounces off the top of his patrol car, nearly missing him. Jeremy Christian was apprehended just moments later, his incomprehensible reign of terror and death swiftly brought to an end. While sitting handcuffed in the back of the patrol car, Jeremy Christian continues in his drunken, incoherent rant, proclaiming aloud how he just, quote, stabbed a bunch of motherfuckers, free speech, or die. He can also be heard yelling aloud, quote, get stabbed in your neck if you hate free speech. I'm airing out motherfuckers' throats. Hopefully those motherfuckers died, especially that motherfucker in the Deadpool shirt. 53-year-old Ricky Best, a retired U.S. Army veteran and Portland City employee, was pronounced dead on the scene by first responders after positioning himself to protect the two young women and trying to intervene in Jeremy Christian's deadly knife attack. 23-year-old Talesian Namkai Meche was unable to recover from his wounds and was pronounced dead a short while after the attack at a nearby hospital. Though most thought that he had been filming Jeremy Christian on the train, he was actually on a phone call with his aunt when he decided that he too needed to take a stand and intervene on behalf of the two young women on what coincidentally was the first day of Ramadan. The 21-year-old PSU student wearing the Deadpool shirt, Micah Fletcher, whom Christian first stabbed in the neck, miraculously survived the encounter. You made a phone call while they were rendering aid to you. That would be correct, yes. Uh, what? Why was it important? I mean, I thought you were going to die. I told us that. Why was it important for you to make a phone call at that point? Because if, if these are going to be my last moments, in my mind, there's just, I just needed to do something real quick. I just needed to make sure that uh, somebody was okay before I went. Who did you call? I called my mother. What did you say? I said, hey, mom, how's it going? I said, hey, mom, how's it going? And, and she said, good. And she said, are you okay? Because she could obviously tell from the sound of my voice that something was happening. And I go, how's it going? She's like, good. And she's like, you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I got hurt. Don't worry, it's fine. And she's like, yeah, okay, where are you? And I explained to her that I'm, on, I'm at the Hollywood Transit Center. Oh. And then, uh, and then, I, then I told her I loved her and uh, that I'd see her soon. And I, uh, I asked her as an aside uh, to call my work and let them know uh, that I wouldn't be making, making it in today. Uh, which seems funny, uh, but the reason I was telling her that is was because I, I didn't want her to realize how hurt I was. And if I'm not going to make it to work today, that means I'm probably going to be there eventually. So, live it all. Yeah. As Micah Fletcher sat bleeding from a single stab wound to his neck, several concerned bystanders helped apply pressure to the deep wound by holding a child's jacket and baby blanket around his throat until paramedics arrived. Testifying at Jeremy Christian's eventual murder trial three years later, he recounts how life forever changed that day and how drastically his emotional and mental health were impacted after the horrific 11-second attack. I began attempting to um, find out how to navigate the new normal of my life. I discovered that gin is an excellent remedy uh, for anxiety. I began drinking um, every day, all day. I can pretty much guarantee you that most of the earlier footage you see from interviews or anything of the like, I was probably at least kind of drunk. At a minimum, if not flat out hammered. I lost nine months. See, I changed a lot from all of this. Went from somebody that was trying to finish off a degree who had just gotten done attempting to join the military and in the face of being denied from that, attempted to actually finish off a college degree. I went from that to somebody that was trying to heal. That was failing. Not less than about two weeks ago. A woman I love now, a new person who has entered my life and I enjoyed the privilege of being able to be with. She was making breakfast as one does. And part of her routine in making that breakfast was using a butter knife to spread butter on toast. She meant nothing by it and I didn't even understand how it happened. But in the process of buttering the toast and raising the knife to her face, all of a sudden I realized that my hand was firmly wrapped around her hand with a knife, seemingly as if it had a mind of its own. And this is ubiquitous now. 
This is in every aspect of my life. There is not a room in this world that I can enter without at least scanning it first to decide who the person is that is most likely to hurt me, how close by they are, attempting the calculations. How many steps would it take them to get to me? I basically spend the first 30 seconds of every event and area that I enter trying to figure out how easily I could die. I wanted to get to know the young ladies that were on the train that day. I wanted to get to know Ricky's son, get to understand how he could be so intelligent and brave, especially when speaking like he did yesterday. I wanted to get to know Asha and all of the other members of Talisian's family, understand that the compassion and warmth that actually emanated from them. But I very quickly realized that I couldn't be in a fucking room with any of them without constantly remembering the corpses and their loved ones. While sharing his victim impact statement on the stand, Micah Fletcher suddenly turned to address Jeremy Christian directly, projecting an uncommon amount of courage, empathy, and understanding while staring the man who desperately tried to kill him directly in the face. And to be quite frank with you, uh, Mr. Christian, I want you to understand something. Um, I don't take it personal. I don't. It's okay, again. Yeah. For me, I'm not gonna speak for anyone else. Okay. Um, I, I absolutely believe that as far as the other families are concerned, I, I hope that they find the deepest punishment they can for you. But as far as you and me, we're good. <laughs> because the fact of the matter is, if what you brought into the court is true, assuming that it is, then that means that uh, you uh, and I both as alcoholics, both as people that are mentally ill. The difference being that I was given an abundance of resources, and you apparently either weren't, or those resources failed to actually be of any service to you. You are in the position you're in, and I'm in the position I'm in. There was a level of humbleness that I've had to come to in order to make it peace that have forced me to realize that you are still a person, as much as what you have done is some of the most heinous shit a person can do. You are not some mythological, all-powerful, terrorist monster. You are a man that was drunk with a knife on a train. And though I hope you sit in a cell for the rest of your life so that you are never able to hurt another person the way you hurt those families again, I do hope that you find a way to become better than what you are today. I hope that if they do provide any resources wherever you go, that you are able to utilize them to make yourself into something better than you are right now because it is abundantly clear that we as a society have not just failed in protecting these families, have not just failed in making it so that things like this don't have to happen. Somebody must have failed miserably when it comes down to raising you. Perhaps most deserving of the answer to the critical question of why are the family and loved ones of Ricky Best and Talisian Namkai Mache, the two men who did not survive the tragic attacks that day in 2017. Their murders reverberated through the TriMet train that Friday afternoon, dramatically impacting everyone as the tidal wave of trauma flowed throughout the enclosed space, haunting each and every passenger who remained entrapped therein after Jeremy Christian began swinging his knife. Former Army medic Morgan Noonan was also on the train that day. And given his experience as an army combat medic, he knew almost immediately that Ricky and Talesian's injuries were fatal, and he suspected both men knew as much as well. And how did you know those two men had been stabbed? Uh, because they were bleeding profusely, arterial bleed. The same arterial bleed you get when a soldier gets shot and maimed, uh, arm blown off, leg blown off, shot in the leg, thigh, anywhere that there's an artery that can be severed. What made you think it was arterial bleed? Color specific. of the blood, how forceful it was, reaction of the person. Everybody reacts differently. Did you believe that Ricky Best based on your assessment, it could be saved. No. There's a breathing pattern that a person goes into when they are no longer in control of their body, where the brain takes over and starts to um, take over respiration to save itself. And Ricky was in that state. He was hyperventilating forcefully to get as much oxygen as he possibly could and was making no eye contact. Um, There's no movement in his body. There's no expression. Uh, the, the color was leaving his body. So um, he was expiring uh, rapidly very fast. And I just want to clarify rapidly for people here in this to understand. When I mean rapidly, waves of his blood were running down the aisle towards me. Like you would see when a wave finishes hitting the ocean, the, the sandbar. It was lapping down the aisle. So I knew every time his heart beat that he was bleeding to death. Tragically, Jeremy Christian's knife punctured a vital artery in Ricky Best's throat, causing the blood to evacuate from his body at an irreversibly fatal rate. After having served and retired after 23 long years in the United States Army, he died a true patriot on the train that day. The father of four and supervisor at Portland's Bureau of Development Services was on his way home to see his family when he was murdered. 
his son Eric would publicly go on record to discuss his father's attempt to intervene in the savage attack. He couldn't just stand by and do nothing. He died fighting the good fight, protecting the innocent. Honestly, that's what he probably wanted. Another passenger on the train, Rachel Macy, rushed to the aid of Talesian Namkai Mache after he was stabbed five total times by Jeremy Christian in the head and neck. Christian walked right past her, but not before offering a few words. As Talesian's standing behind me, Jeremy takes a step and uses vulgar language and says, colored people are ruining his city, get off his train, and then just walked away. But Talesian turned to me and he said, I need your help, please don't leave me, don't leave me. And so I told him, just lay, lay down, we can handle this, we, we can do this, it's, it's, you, it's, we can handle this. And I stayed away from phrases like, hang on, please, breathe harder. No one was coming, I didn't hear sirens, I didn't see EMTs, I'm just alone with him holding my shirt that I took off and, and holding against his neck. And I just vividly remember him kind of smiling at me. He closed his eyes and nodded, and I put my hand on his face. And as he opened his eyes, he put his hand on my face and said, tell the people on this train I love them. I just felt compelled to tell him that if he needed to go on to his next journey to go, and that if he chose to do so, I would tell the world. As they took Talesian and put him on a board to carry him up to get him to the ambulance to get to the hospital, he took one last big breath, and he looked at me, and he was starting to panic. And I'm telling him, look in my eyes. I see you. I'm still here. I really wanted him to live. Talesian died later that day after being rushed to the hospital at the age of 23. He was a graduate of Reed College in Portland, Oregon, with a degree in economics. He was interning at the Cadmus Consulting Group at the time, and his plans for an eventual career are tragically cut short. Talesian's sister went on to say this about her beloved brother. We lost him in a senseless act that brought close to home the insidious rift of prejudice and intolerance that is too familiar, too common. He was resolute in his conduct and respect of all people. In his final act of bravery, he held true to what he believed is the way forward. He will live in our hearts forever as the just, brave, loving, hilarious, and beautiful soul he was. We ask that in honor of his memory, we use this tragedy as an opportunity for reflection and change. We choose love. Safe journey, Talisha. We love you. On the day of his sentencing, Jeremy Christian appears in court without his characteristically long hair, having shaved it in random patches, leaving a bizarre combination of short patchy hair and bald spots. Demetria Hester, the woman who was attacked by Christian on the train just the day before he committed the murders, spoke to him directly from the stand, triggering one last hate-filled rant before he was escorted out of the courtroom. I blame the system for creating and facilitating people like Jeremy, and then we, the community, have to deal with them. In my case, the white supremacist got special treatment from the police. The police captured, not killed, a racist white supremacist known to the police, holding the bloody knife he attacked and killed people with while drinking wine from his Gatorade bottle. And to Mr. Jeremy Christian, your mom should have swallowed you. You are a waste of breath. And when you die and go to hell, I hope you rot. See you there, bitch. Yeah, okay. Go back but to Tennessee, no, too. You, what do I tell you? Go back to Tennessee, too. You can, we don't want you here. Oh, All your race ain't bullshit. You ain't gonna be married, bitch. You ain't gonna be married, bitch. Fucking hoes. Fucking hoes. Fucking hoes. Fucking hoes. Fucking hoes. George Ford. George Ford. Fucking. I should've killed you, bitch. I should've killed you, bitch. Everybody go through a lot. Jeremy Christian refused to take any responsibility for the horrific murders of Ricky Best and Talesian Namkai Mache. His attorneys claimed it was a case of self-defense all along, claiming that had their client not been so aggressively approached by Micah Fletcher, he would never have felt so threatened that he discreetly retrieved his knife and with the savage efficiency of a hardened prisoner, stabbed three grown men a total of 11 times in a matter of just a few seconds, nearly every single one of their wounds potentially fatal. Jeremy Christian was convicted by a jury of his peers and eventually sentenced in June of 2020 to two consecutive life sentences in prison without the possibility of parole. He also received 26 additional years for the attempted murder of his only surviving victim, Micah Fletcher, in addition to assault and intimidation. And while we can speculate that Jeremy Christian was merely a product of his environment, of a hard life lived, the young man who ventured down the wrong path and onto darkened criminal streets, or the young adult clearly suffering from substance abuse and mental health issues. Regardless, Jeremy Christian got onto the train that Friday afternoon, a powder keg of vengeful rage and hatred, literally begging for someone to confront him. In the end, Perhaps the very systems that failed his victims might well have failed Jeremy Christian as well. Before he was escorted away to begin serving his sentence, Micah Fletcher, his only surviving victim, had a few last words of his own to offer the court. Now, I'm gonna give you a hint. Violence is cheap and free. It's not something that's super useful. It's not something super valuable. It isn't. 
but it's an easy solution to a very complicated problem. And the dilemma is I'm over simple solutions to complicated problems. We've been trying that for a very long time, and it's not working. We have to do something different. We have to actually invest in each other. As a community, make sure that our youth are being raised in a way where they don't feel the need to burglarize liquor stores, end up in a cycle where they spin drive from prisons to homelessness to prisons, and end up drunk on trains murdering people. I hate the fact that I am essentially saying something that makes it sound like I have an iota of shit to give for the men that essentially ruined my life. But I only say these things because I want shit like this to never happen again. I don't ever want to have to look another family in the eye and miss a person that I never even got the chance to meet. Thank you for listening to Invisible Choir. If you enjoyed the show, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you subscribe. And visit InvisibleChoir.com to learn about our Patreon program, Invisible Choir Premium, which brings you additional episodes and bonus content for just a few dollars per month. (laughs) 